Alright, so welcome back everyone. It's time for another bit of space with JP. What have you got for us this week? This week I figured I'd talk a little bit about a kind of fundamental difference between how the Americans and Soviets tackled some of the challenges in space. Mm. Uh, That is fuel cells versus batteries. Uh, So, you know, when you're in space, you need electricity to run your Mm -hmm. fancy navigation computer and science equipment and whatever else you got. (laughs) Uh, So where are you going to get that electricity from? You know, Uh, uh, the Soviets decided to go with big, heavy batteries Mm -hmm. and uh, also with solar panels. And then we decided to go with uh, fuel cells. So uh, totally different technologies. Yeah. So what is a fuel cell? I I hear the term, but all, all I know of is, you know, a battery. Yeah, a fuel cell is basically just, it takes oxygen, it, uh, hi- oxygen, hydrogen, burns it, and gets energy that way. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can get, and one of the great side effects of this is the only byproduct is water. And it's uh... like, all right, well, you know, we can use that. Uh, and, you know, in the meantime, you've got extra oxygen if you need it. So, you know, just to kind of take a step back, water is like the most amazing thing in space because <laughs> you can drink it, you can breathe it, you can burn it. And you can make electricity with it. So wow. it's kind of like perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we went with, so other than the you know initial early flight, early Mercury flights, which did use batteries, mm-hmm. uh, for these longer duration flights, we went with uh, fuel cells. Because mm-hmm. the idea is you can kind of, you know, control them to a uh, uh, really, you know, find the control of the electricity flow. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you have this, mate- you know, have hydrogen and oxygen with you anyway. It's kind of like a great thing to have all around. Um, they're relatively simple once you get it going. Um, so great. Uh, the Soviets ended up going with uh, solar panels and batteries. Mm-hmm. Uh, solar panels makes a lot of sense. You're in space. Nothing's really there to get in the way, mm-hmm. except the only issue with that is the Earth can get in the way on uh, every pass through the orbit. Yeah. Uh, something that the space station has to deal with. You know, you basically have to be able to have this system that can handle, you know, rapidly charging, rapidly discharging over and over and over again. Mm. Uh, I think, as I understand it, like these days, you know, spacecraft have gotten a lot better at handling that stuff. But back in the '60s, this was still like, you know, pretty new stuff. Obviously, uh, yeah, so, sure, you know, it could lead to a lot of challenges. Uh, another problem with the batteries is so now you're carrying your fuel, your air, your water, and you get these big, super heavy batteries with you mm-hmm. as you go. Yeah. Uh, but so the Gemini pr- uh, program used them. The uh, Apollo program used them. In fact. That was one of the main concerns with uh, Apollo 13. You know, they were never really worried about running out of oxygen. You know, they mm-hmm. did run into that problem with uh, too much CO2 that the movie mm-hmm. covered so well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were really concerned about losing uh, essentially fuel for the fuel cells. Because if you lose uh, all your electricity, uh, you know, that's it. You know, you can't, you're not going to be able to make it all the way back. You're going to lose all your heat. You're going to lose all your guidance, all control of the vehicle. Yeah. Um, shuttle used the same thing. In fact, they had two, uh, you know, I think they're really big uh, fuel cell systems since it's obviously a much bigger uh, vehicle. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought there. But, uh, <laughs> you, you, know, you know, I'm kind of wondering, so this is the reverse of hydrolysis. You're combining hydrogen and oxygen back together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, so storing up the power to recharge those fuel cells, how, how is that done? Is that, did the U.S. use solar solar cells to perform the hydrolysis to recharge the the fuel cell or no see the whole so they would just send up the vehicle with the hydrogen and oxygen separated in the first place so they would fuel uh, uh, fill up these tanks like in the case of apollo you would have for instance like that was that was a blew up on apollo 13 was this big spherical tank like with these ridiculous pressures very high psi mm. uh, full of oxygen and you know in apollo 13 they were stirring the tanks to make sure they didn't get kind of kind of you know at those temperatures and those pressures the oxygen can get kind of slushy and sludgy and it would kind of sit, sit in place <laughs> the idea uh, <laughs> yeah exactly so they would uh just uh bring it all up ahead of time uh one thing about that is it did you know not as if the humans didn't do this already but it did put a hard limit on the length of the missions you know mm. with solar panels uh... and batteries you can kind of go an arbitrary amount of time, you know, mm-hmm. eventually, of course, the batteries will die out on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like, you know, for instance, that's the reason like Spirit and Opportunity were able to go for so long because it's solar panels and batteries, you can just keep on trucking. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas Curiosity, eventually, you know, that battery, you know, it's nuclear power, but eventually that battery will give out and that'll be the end of it. Mm-hmm. With, the, with the byproduct of, of water, did they have to form any containment for that? Did they have any problems with condensation and moisture building up? Uh, so they, they wouldn't have anything like that because uh, it was all within that one system. But it is interesting uh, how you end up with excess like waste water, which is, <laughs> you know, getting stuff into space. It's so especially water, which is so heavy, is so expensive that the idea of wastewater seems kind of crazy. So, you know, that was actually, you know, what the space 
sh- uh, station, never really a big concern while the shuttle was flying because they could always basically transfer over a bunch of extra water mm. uh, that they weren't going to be able, you know, they weren't going to need in the first place. Mm. Now, that kind of water, I mean, it obviously it's not going to be like tap water exactly. Is that ultra pure water? What kind of water is it? You know what? I don't know off the top of my head, but huh. I would be, you know, really surprised if it wasn't just pure distilled water because yeah. otherwise you're going to have to deal with all the impurities and, you know, those systems are already super complicated <laughs> enough without throwing in, hey, this has got some fluoride in there. <laughs> How's that going to react to your system? Who knows? Sure, absolutely. So when you have these fuel cells, I mean, is that sort of um, is that process um, relatively more fragile? Does it, does, it, does it create more complexity compared to batteries? Yeah, so I think you know you, it, it's kind of a trade-off. It is you know you, you kind of have this active system, whereas I think you can kind of argue that you know batteries are a little bit less high maintenance. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have any like moving parts and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. With a fuel cell, you kind of got you got various fluids. You got to make sure all these valves are working properly. Uh, you've got to make sure you don't just you know over make sure those combinations don't get overzealous and you cause just a big explosion. Uh, but the payoff is you kind of you get a lot more power out of it, and you know it just the trade-off is worth it, uh, at least mm. so far it has been, because it just uh, you end up with all this extra power, all this extra water, and everything, and ends up being you know just what they just what they needed. And this this was being done back in the in the sixties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness, because because we've just recently in the past you know ten years heard about consumer or at least uh, professional industrial um, fuel cells as a potential. Mm. But... Right, I believe that. So I think the challenge there is. Uh, you know, for one thing, it's not okay for those fuel cells to just cost millions of dollars, and that's just how it works. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're talking about mm. uh, like having around in a car, you've got to have something that's going to be, you know, affordable, something that you can you can use for more than a couple of weeks, mm. something that's not going to blow up if it hits something. Like you know, they can pretty much count on the spaceship not hitting something. Mm. Uh, but you're right. I mean, like this is a uh, this technology has a lot of promise. Like they've talked about, you know, for instance, if you can get a really solid uh, solar array on your roof. You can use that power to separate the hydrogen and oxygen in water, and then you can recombine that later when you need electricity. Uh, or you know, uh, being you know, able to store the electricity for longer periods of time than a lead acid battery or something else like that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's also handy for stuff like you know, you know, I would imagine that it would get a lot of use out of something like a Mars program, where they can just harvest the hydrogen and oxygen right out of the air. And, you know, power, you know, you, you can get, you know, the solar power is there on Mars, but not quite as powerful due to us uh, just further away from the sun. So it's like, hey, let's just grab some of this ice, melt this up, and off we go. Gotcha. Now, if you're talking about a longer term mission, are there any impacts there? You know, well, I guess the problem would be if you were talking about a longer uh, mission while in space, the problem is you're only going to be able to carry so much hy- uh, hydrogen uh, and oxygen with you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, something like the, sh- like the station, they bring up, you know, essentially resupply it every now and then so mm-hmm. they can get away with it there. Something like Mars, they can just kind of go and get more water and mm-hmm. take care of it that way. Now, I think for, uh, for really long-term pure spaceflight missions, they'd probably want to go with either, you know, some battery, like probably using the, what they learned with the station, some solar arrays and batteries, or depending on what you're doing, maybe even just to go nuclear. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like the ultra battery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When radiation really doesn't matter is, you know, way out beyond Earth. Like, who yeah, yeah. 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 It's actually kind of a shame that, you know, uh, there's a lot of interesting nuclear applications that can mm. be used in space, but it's not really, I mean, it's a technical challenge, but it's mostly a political challenge yeah. because, you know, nuclear is a big scary word. And it kind of reminds me how they uh, renamed MRIs. They used to be uh, nuclear magnetic uh, resonance imaging. And they're just like, no, 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 let's just call it MRI. You're going to nuke my brain. The <laughs> they don't want to go in the nuke tube. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's got to be one of the big challenges of space flight in general is this whole question of how you power things over long term. I mean, space really doesn't have a lot of, or maybe it does have a lot of um, just sort of power generation opportunities. Well, with solar panels these days, it's actually gotten pretty great. I mean, uh-huh. you know, I think you kind of look at, uh, you know, the space station's got those four giant arrays. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There goes the cat. <laughs> <laughs> four giant arrays, and, you know, every once in a while, one of them goes down, and they're still doing okay. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, I think they could even get by with one or two uh, on emergency mode. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these things last a lot longer than they used to. That's a large part of what, you know, the whole point of, like, you know, Mir and Skylab and ISS mm-hmm. was, was to learn how to handle stuff like that and for really long duration spaceflight. Mm-hmm. But that's uh, an instantaneous uh, current, but 
it would still need to be stored to su- for for future use or if you're passing behind something. So mm. maybe right. a combination of solar battery and fuel cell. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I wonder about that. That would be really interesting to see how like the math works out in that. Like, can you you know keep fuel cells around for you know emergency use or for like extended periods of darkness or like you know while you're working on the solar array and you know could you use uh, the electricity from the solar array to break your water back down? Yeah, yeah. I'd be interested mm-hmm. to know about that. Well, and you see stuff like and I'm forgetting the name of the uh, the large spacecraft in The Martian. Where that's you know, meant to be out there for hundreds and hundreds of days. The Hermes, the Hermes. Hermes, thank you. Um, uh, you know, you, you got to imagine that there's that you want to have multiple redundant systems with different, you know, requirements plan and different B. expectations. Yeah, Plan C, Plan D. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and have them all, you know, made by different companies so they fail in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, the idea of using local resources is very appealing mm-hmm. 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 because that 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 means that we can set up further and have a have a reach that uh, uh, I, I think that that gives more tools to our bag mm-hmm. <laughs> in situ resource utilization there that's we go the, that's the big keyword <laughs> no, that's why that's why people get so excited when they find water on the moon or uh, you know Mars is more of a they're looking for life but with the moon it's like oh man you know if we can get this water we've got oxygen we've got water we've got rocket fuel it's all you need mm-hmm. all an astronaut needs <laughs> Nice. Cool. That is absolutely fascinating. It's, it's, it's interesting to see how, um, and not only, you know, are, are we trying to, you know, get further, but a lot of our, the solutions we've come up with came up, came up with back in the sixties. Yeah. It's yeah. Better, long yeah. ago. <laughs> now. Wow. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's, it's really fascinating reading about these earlier missions and seeing either like technology that's exactly the same you're like wow i guess i got it right the first time or like super early like oh i know where you're gonna be in 20 years <laughs> <laughs> not there yeah yeah cool that's fat well thank you so much thank you yeah